Good morning, good morning, Warriors. How's you? <sighs> good morning, Warriors. How's it going? It's always better. You always get second chances. Isn't that good? God is good. And um, <clears throat> I, uh, it's a privilege to be here with you all. I've got, I've got my tumbler. Um, I've got my Bible. I want to invite you, if you have your Bible or your Bible app on your phone, uh, to turn with me to Isaiah 43. We are continuing to look at this idea of desire and devotion. And uh, Friday's chapel was amazing with, with Mandy and Hapreet just sharing about their own um, devotional life with the Lord. And I'm just um, springboarding off of that. I want to invite you to use your phones only for the Bible app at this point. Not because I have anything great to say, but because I really believe that God wants to say something. Because there was a lot keeping me from this morning. Um, uh, in fact, yesterday I couldn't even talk. So I'm excited to see what God wants to say. And uh, so I want to invite you to just keep your phones, if you're going to have them on, on the Bible app. Um, and if you if, if that's a real challenge, you guys are warriors, so I know that you can face that challenge and just take a break. That screen doesn't dictate your life. Amen? So just take a little break and tune in because God wants to say something uh, here this morning. So the words will be on the screen as well in case you don't have a Bible or an app. Uh, Isaiah 43, 1 through 3, one of my favorite portions of Scripture. But now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that every one of those words is true. Every one of those claims on us from our God, from our Lord, and from our Savior is true right now, in this moment. Whether we're close to you or we're far from you, whether we know you or we don't yet know you, I believe that every person is here, myself included, not by chance or random circumstance, but because you want to meet with us. I pray that you give us ears to hear, Spirit, what it is that you want to say to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Ian McLaren, um, one of my favorite old school Scottish pastors, put it this way. He said, be kind for everyone is fighting a hard battle. Be kind for everyone is fighting a hard battle. I'm a little under the weather today. Anybody else a little under the weather today? A lot of sickness going around. But how many of us don't show your hands? How many of us are not only a little under the weather, but a little under life right now? Life is just overwhelming. To the point of, of pain, of hurt. Maybe it's relationships. Maybe it's being overwhelmed with everything that's on your to-do list. Maybe it's just the stressors of, man, all this plus I'm under the weather. So I wanted to encourage you this morning, not only with God's word, but a little bit of our story. Uh, my lovely wife is joining me uh, here today so she can fact check everything that I'm saying. Nothing like your spouse to keep you honest um, before you all. But I want to share with you probably the toughest person I ever met. We're going to call her Little H and we're going to um, honor her story. But I want to let you know that when Little H came into our life, Back on September 28th, which actually happened to be September 28th, 2018, was the last time I spoke in chapel. Well, later on in that afternoon at 1.47 p.m., little H showed up at our door. In fact, she got out of the car, and this is what she had in her hand, was a black plastic trash bag. And that hit my wife and I like a ton of bricks because, what you see, when we went through the foster and the adopt certification process, we watched this, like, rip your heart out, stomp on it a few times, video about what this is going to look like. And the, the visceral part that stood out to me was the black trash bag. And to see little H show up to our house, a little kid of the age of six, with a black trash bag, we're like, whoa, this is real. All of a sudden, this just got really real, like really, really, really real. And I'll never forget, she peeked out of the back door of this little Honda Accord, and she looked, at, she looked at me and then slammed the door. And then she peeked out again and smiled, and out popped her with her little black trash bag. 
We haven't really told her story much. It's her story to tell, and we want to honor that. But I want to share with you God's father devotion and his heart for his kids. We did post this um, brief photo, and I'm asking it that it just stays here in chapel, but I want to show it to you because it's my favorite photo of little H. So that's on the screen. Just, just look at her eyes. Like, there's this intense look in those baby brown eyes. And then look at her jaw. Like, it is set. Um, and this is what we, what we posted. It says, this determined look on our youngest as she navigates Times Square is one of a fighter. We got to go back east on a family trip, and we were in New York for less than 24 hours, and we're walking through Times Square. We had the big parent-kid talk, everybody hold hands. Like, we could not get separated here. How many of you have been to Times Square? It doesn't matter what time of day it is. Just, you got to hold hands. And so she was, she was just like locked on, death grip on dad's hand. Sometimes this look of a fighter means that she fights even herself. She's fought to survive since the day she was born prematurely to a young mother on drugs and flatlined for 10 minutes before doctors could resuscitate her at birth. She has fought. She's fought abuse. She's fought neglect for the first few years of her life before going into the foster care system where, unfortunately, she continued to experience abuse. Five placements later, she's forever home. She's a fighter, and her God fights for her. And we pray that the God of all peace would be her peace. That's from 2 Thessalonians 3.16. And we pray that she continues to fight for herself and fight for the good of others for the rest of her life. Why? Because she's worth fighting for. You see that photo? It's my favorite photo, but it was actually a photo I took by mistake. I took the family like obligatory selfie in Times Square. And then I accidentally left my photo on and I just went walking. And I kept taking all these photos through Times Square. And that's one of her. It's one of my favorites. I remember the first day that she showed up with that trash bag. We didn't know what to do. All of this was real. We waited till our other three kids got home from school. And like, what do you do when a new like, kid comes into the crew? We walked to the park. We didn't know what else to do. So we just walked to the park. And she loves swings. So we started swinging next to her. And she said, she said, hire, hire daddy. This is like after an hour of being there. And she goes, oops, I called you daddy. And I'm like, well, that's okay. Would you like to call me daddy? And she goes, yes. I said, I'd like that too. Much to my wife's chagrin because that means that all four of our kids now have all called me dad first. <laughs> four for four. <laughs> In 2019, there were approximately 440,000 kids in the foster system in the United States of America. 440,000. 60,000 just in California. If I were to ask you to raise your hand to see if you're a Christian here this morning and then ask you to keep your hand up if you were adopted, you would need to keep both your hands up because the Bible describes us as being adopted in Christ. Ephesians 1.5 says, God predestined us for adoption in himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. That's God's will. And so there's three quick things that I want to share with you in our short time here this morning is that love is greater than biology. The last is always greater than the first. And forever is always greater than the temporary. Love is always greater than biology. There is this fierceness that transcends biology when I first met little H. Like, I wanted to get her life out of a trash bag real quick. And I wanted to just fight and smash anything that would have put her life in that bag to begin with. And that didn't have to do with me knowing her for any length of time or for her doing anything for me. It just was the virtue of the fact that saying, God was saying, I'm entrusting this little one to you and my heart is for her. And I'm sharing a little bit of that with you. You see, God can't love us any more or any less than he already does. One of my pastimes, it's therapeutic, it keeps me sane. I love to garden. I know it's really old and to do, but it's sort of my hobbit side of myself. I love to garden, and my kids don't like to garden. I make them go out because I'm trying to teach them like things in life, and they'll last for maybe about 10, 15 minutes. Any of you kids out there? I was totally like that with my dad. I'm like, yeah, I'll help you. you know, peace. Um, 
But little H, she just wants to be with me and she'll stay out there for hours just because she wants to be with me. Not that she's actually a help because there was one time, (laughs) there was one time I'm sitting here planting a row of winter lettuces and I turn around and she's unplanting the whole row of winter lettuces. (laughs) And, uh, And I just thought, well, isn't that the way it is with God in us? God's like, I just want to spend time with you, and all that you're bringing to me is slowing me down and messing this thing up, but I still want to spend time with you. I want to fight for you. I just want to be with you. God's love just wants to be with you, and maybe this is a weird way of looking at it, but understanding God's love may mean taking a look at God's anger. Studying this recently, God's anger always needs to be provoked, but not his love. God's anger is always direct, specific, and temporary. His love is always wide, deep, and eternal. That's the difference between God's love and God's anger. God, is in his love, just wants to be connected. Elie Wiesel, a Nobel Larry author and Holocaust survivor, put this this way. The opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. The opposite of art is not ugliest, ug- ugliness, it's indifference. The opposite of faith is not heresy, it's indifference. And the opposite of life is not death, it's indifference. God is saying, don't be indifferent to me. I love you. I would give anything for you. Jeremiah 31, 3, the Lord appeared to me, Israel, from ages past, saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you and continued my faithfulness to you. That's in the Amplified Version. I like the New Living Translation, too. It says, long ago, the Lord said to Israel, I have loved you, my people, with an everlasting love, with an unfailing love. I have drawn you to myself. Love is always greater than biology. And the last is always greater than the first. A friend of mine was adopted and he was on staff at a Christian university. I remember talking to him and he was saying, you know, when I was first brought into my foster home, which later became my adoptive home, I had this real struggle with hoarding food because my entire life, I never knew if I was going to have enough food. And I specifically remember my parents, my adopted foster parents at the time, just finding all this food under my bed, under my mattress. And I remember my dad sitting me down on the side of my bed and saying, you know what? Can you tell me what your last name is now? And he said, he said, the family's last name. And he's like, that's right. You're part of the family. Which means that you will always have food. Which means that when you have our last name, you are a part of this family. And I understand that's a process. And I understand that that takes time to grapple with that reality and take that on board to say, I am part of this family. I no longer need to act like I have scarcity and want and fear and anxiety of where I'm going to eat the next day. But when you're part of this family, you begin to take on the family resemblance, and this is how we do things in our family. You see, when we finally adopted little H after seven or eight months with her, we went to the court, and we were there, and it was this whole thing. It was amazing. I didn't get to be there for her birth, but I got to be there for the day that she was adopted and got our last name. And she said, I want to be a hype man. We didn't coach her on that, but like deep down inside, the dad thing was like, yes, you do. Like, yes, (laughs) you are (laughs) forever. But where it really came through is after the courtroom, they started handing us all this paperwork. And one of them was her old birth certificate and an application for a new birth certificate with a new last name. She has a completely new birth certificate. Guys, that is the way it works with us when we come to Christ, that he places us in families and he's a father to the fatherless, Psalm 68, five through six says. He's a defender of widows. God in his holy dwelling, in his house, God sets the lonely in families and he leads out the prisoners with singing. God begins to worship when this kind of stuff happens. That's how devoted he is to us. It's amazing. I can't speak in chapel without giving a C.S. Lewis quote and a shout out to all my FYE people that have ever had an FYE with me. From Mere Christianity, Lewis puts it this way. He says, hey, look, 
<clears throat> Actually, he doesn't say that. <laughs> but he says, if we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. You were made for another place. Somebody once said, every other place you fit in, home is a place that fits you. How many of us are longing for that place that fits us? I know we are. Jesus knew that too. So when he said in John's gospel, chapter 14, he said, don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many rooms. There is no shortage. There is no scarcity. You have a place. He said, if it were not so, I would have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself. That where I am, you may also be. And you know the way where I'm going. Now, I love Thomas because he's like far out. I don't know where you're going. How can we know that? Lord, we don't know. How can we know? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. If you'd known me, you would have known my Father also, and from now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. Philip said to him, the question that we would all like to ask, just show us God and that'll be enough. I mean, wouldn't that be excellent for your faith? Just show us God and that'll be enough. Jesus said, how long have I been with you? And you still don't know me, Philip. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. And then he skips down a little bit later in that same chapter, verse 18. He says, check it out. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Maybe you have an experience with foster and adoption. Maybe you are a foster and adopted kid. I've met a few of you. I'm in awe of you. You're like my heroes. The fight that you've had to go through to get here to Jessup, the fight that all of you are on to be a student here, to be the brilliant selves that you are, to the, e the easy doesn't come with college. Those two aren't synonymous. The myth is that it's easier for somebody else sitting next to you. It's not. Every one of you are fighting, and fighting hard. And I want to let you know that it's worth it. But Jesus isn't going to leave you. So I want to wrap up with this final point that, yes, love is greater than biology, that, yes, last is greater than first, and finally, that Temporary is greater than forever. That adoption is a moment, but forever in the family is forever. My wife and I, um, we got the pleasure of, uh, towards the end of our Christian liberal arts education experience in our undergrad to go on a global outreach trip. And so we went to Nairobi, Kenya, and we had the craziest bus driver. His name was Zach. This local guy, and he drove us all over the place around Nairobi, and he would tell us, I would always like to sit just behind the seat because his stories were amazing. He'd point out different things, and then like this baboon ran across the road, and he's like, oh, almost got it. And uh, <laughs> stuff that could almost, you know, like only happen in Africa. <clears throat> Sorry, my beard keeps rubbing this mic and just makes this scratching noise. Just kidding, I don't really have a beard. <laughs> Never really had one of those. <clears throat> but I remember he would drive through the streets in Nairobi and say, you have to drive like Zimba. You have to drive like a lion. And I'm like, man, I'm never going to drive here, like especially a bus in Nairobi. But I remember we were driving into Mathare or Dandora, one of the largest slums in East Africa. I forget which one. And we pulled over to the side of the road on that dirt road, the red dirt road that you can only experience in East Africa. If you've been there, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And he pulls over and he's like, we're going to pick up the daughter of the mighty king. We're going to pick her up. And I was thinking, whoa, well, maybe this is like a tribal leader. Or maybe this is like some, you know, something going on. We were near like some of the Maasai area. And, and I was expecting, you know, something great or something impressive or, or what. And we pulled up in front of this like little um, convenience mart. And this young um, woman got on our same age, like, early 20-something, and he goes, there she is, daughter of the mighty king. And she kind of gave this sheepish sort of embarrassed smile and sat in the chair, or sat in the row just behind the driver. And he, and he said, daughter of the mighty king, her dad is Jesus. Her father is the Lord. And he just starts like praising her. It was awesome. And I'm like, who was I to think like she's somebody special in this world? She's special in all of eternity. 
And I think about that when little H comes up with her black trash bag and I'm like, she's the daughter of the mighty king. My greatest prayer for her that she would know her king forever. You know what the Bible never mentions after adoption? It mentions adoption a lot, but you know what it never mentions after adoption? Is adoption. Isn't that cool? When we are adopted, we are adopted in him through Christ to the Father. But after we're adopted, we're never mentioned as being his adopted. That's not your label anymore. That's not your last name. And that's not where God's love leads you. You are now part of his forever family. And God gave his son to make us his daughters and his sons. And some things are really worth fighting for. All right. Well, It's not just the trash bags. Maybe you've seen or heard that parable of, of the little starfish. You know, kind of the cheesy one that makes Hallmark cards and little plaque, or like little signs or whatever, that there was a person walking down the shoreline one day and saw these starfish that were stranded on the beach and began just picking them up one by one and throwing them into the water. And somebody came along next to the person and said, what are you doing? You're just wasting your time. There's no way that you can get to the thousands of these starfish. And he picks up another one and throws it into the water. The person said, what difference are you making? He said, I made a difference to this one. Maybe maybe you've heard that story. I've heard that story. I've believed that story. I believe that adoption is a big part of that story. But I I believe that story, if you were to end there, leaves it short. Because the difference isn't just for the person who threw, uh, for the starfish itself, but for the person who threw the starfish as well. And then when that starfish goes back into the sea and tells all the other starfish, hey, low tide's coming. Don't be near the shoreline. You see, adoption breaks the cycle. It breaks the black trash bags. Nobody should live their life as a kid in a black trash bag. Nobody. I wasn't sure if I was going to share this story. I've never shared this story. I ask that you just keep it between us. I trust you all. I care deeply about you and God's heart for you. But I was thinking about sharing something else. There's a lot going on right now in work and life. And I was like, maybe I'll just take a message that I've done before, kind of dust it off, blow it off, and like do something with that. And I was getting my haircut on Friday at 8 a.m. I mean, who gets their haircut on Friday at 8 a.m.? It was like me and two hairdressers in there. And we start chit-chatting and whatever. And um, we started talking about kids as we do. And she's like, how many kids do you have? I have four. And it somehow it came up to our youngest being adopted. And she said, how old was she when she was adopted? I said, she was six. And the hairdresser stops. And she goes, I was five. And then she's like, come over here. And there was only two hairdressers in there, like the three of us, the only people in the place. And the other hairdresser came over and she's like, she's like, I was adopted too later on in life. Everybody wants little, little babies, but thank you for adopting an older one. I'm like, why are you thanking me? Like, I didn't even understand what adoption meant or God's heart for adoption until I met little H. I had no idea what that meant. And then they proceeded to tell me their story and different things. And I go, it's not just a single starfish. Guys, your life's transformed, shine. And they go brilliantly. So just like that conversation I had with little H on the first day I met her, when she asked, can I call you dad? And the father says, well, would you like to call me dad? She says, yes. And the father's always going to say, I'd like that too. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you, God, for your father's heart for us that transcends any black trash bags in our lives, in our past. God, your love is so much greater than biology. It transcends our our names, whatever the world has labeled us with, whatever names we've been called, whatever we're carrying around and finding our identity in social media or hashtag or in whatever. God, that we're in a forever family because of Jesus. If anybody wants to be in that and has never been there before, I would just invite you to ask Jesus to come into your life right now. Say, Lord, I want to be part of your family. I may not even know what that means, but I ask that you come into my life, empty my bag, and replace it with your love. Lord Jesus, I thank you for each one of these students. Bless them in their fight and their endeavor and the challenge they're facing here at university. 
give them every grace. God, give them every um, support and care and surround them with your love and surround them with good friends. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.